Your eyes on the times, you walk ready to speak up. But with so many problems, you're exhausted trying to keep up. This is the Church Politics Podcast, where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview. We're not trying to be conservative or progressive. We're trying to be Christian in the public square. And I'm black as heaven. I'm made in God's image. Nobody can change my settings. Amen. Amen. Cut off my knees and put it into my search. It's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth. Which is no good, Ann Camp. You're listening to the Ann Campaign's Church Politics Podcast with Justin Gibney, a.k.a. Bishop Cooper's grandson. And the Windy City representative, the baddest brother above the Mason-Dixon line, my play cousin, the right reverend, Christopher Butler. Now, Chris, it's been a while since we had a podcast. I'm sure some of our people have noticed. And it's really all my fault. I kind of explained this a little bit, I think, on one of the episodes, if I'm not mistaken. But no, I actually explained, explained it on one of the civic updates. But I'm in the middle of finishing a book. Um, I think you're going to enjoy this book when it comes out. But it's not necessarily an easy process because I want to make this as good as possible. So it's been my fault. Not, you know, I like to blame things on Chris. Unfortunately, I couldn't even stretch the truth enough to blame this on Chris. (laughs) This is all my fault. All right. Uh, But we will be back with a vengeance soon. But even though I was taking a little bit of a break during July, we had to talk about what's been going on this week. So, Chris, how you been doing, man? You You ready to get back into it? Yes, indeed. Uh, these are uh, interesting times and, you know, uh, ready to discuss. So um, uh, I, people who are watching on YouTube have to forgive my background. Uh, I'm in the conference room uh, down here in Atlanta again. He's in Atlanta. He's visiting us in Atlanta. He graced us with his presence from Chicago in Atlanta because he's here for the national uh, was a National Black Fellowship of Assemblies of God. Fellowship of the AG. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he's fellowshipping with his, uh, with his uh, uh, denomination. You know, having a good time. He got a chance, and I and I'm gonna talk about this too uh, when we do our interview with Sarita Lyons. But he got a chance to uh, speak on just kingdom politics and how Christians should engage politics, and did a very good job in that man. So we're glad to have you in Atlanta, as always. Um, I know you brought your daughter with you. I hope you've been having a good time, man. Yes, indeed. We're uh, we love it here, so it's uh, it's nice to to visit. And in fact, if if you're listening to this podcast and I did not hit you up and you're in Atlanta, especially if you're in my family, uh, it's only because we had a long conference and a short trip. So I appreciate that, man. <laughs> we 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 appreciate that. Uh, hey, man. You can't see, sometimes it's hard to see everybody, right? But he, I guess through this podcast, which will come after, you know, he come out after he leaves, he's making some attempt to reach yes. out to some of these people. So, <laughs> so, so I, I can appreciate that, my brother. I can appreciate that. All right, guys, this is really just going to be a, uh, not too quick, but it's going to be an update on what's going on. We'll kind of share with you our thoughts on just all the things that have happened as of late. But before we get to that, as always, I want to give a shout out to all of our patrons and supporters for supporting us in what we do and how we do it. As you know, we talk a lot about, uh, we talk about a lot of things that other podcasts aren't going to talk about, whether it's the Christian sexual ethic or it's um, supremacy and all these social justice issues, meaning we don't fit into the right or the left, which makes it very hard for us to get support. So we need you guys to support us so we can keep doing this. Uh, And we thank all the people that already support us. So if you want to become a patron, if you become a patron, you can get a premium episode. So we don't only do this episode. We actually do premium episodes. And if you go to patreon.com slash church politics, you can become a patron by giving every month. And we would greatly appreciate that. If you are watching on YouTube, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Okay. Um, But you know, it's no different than we always say, right? Uh, Grab your Bible, get your mind right and prepare to think not like a Republican, not like a Democrat, but to think like a Christian. You would have to be living under a rock not to know that um, there was an assassination attempt this weekend. Um, According to USA Today, an investigation led by the FBI found that Thomas Matthew, Matthew Crooks, 
a 20 year old from Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, fired multiple shots towards the stage where uh, former President Donald Trump was speaking to a crowd of his supporters, according to statements released by the FBI and the Secret Service. Crooks fired an AR-15 style rifle from a roof about 150 yards away and was killed by Secret Service agents moments after firing. Videos published by multiple outlets, including USA Today, show Trump abruptly reaching uh, for his right ear, looking at his bloody hand and then dropping down behind the podium. People nearby uh, can be heard saying shots, shots, shots. And a moment later, Secret Service agents surrounded Trump and escorted him off the stage. Chris, when I first found out about this, I was actually at a concert. I was nowhere near anything political. And I just started getting hit with all these different uh, texts and, and and all that stuff saying, hey, what happened? Is this real? What's going on? It was a kind of a surreal experience. I mean, when something like that, like this happens, it's not like we're used to it, right? It was kind of right. a surreal experience. What was your initial reaction to this? We can't call it anything but political violence. Yeah, it was uh it was it was a shock. I was um I was working uh, at my desk. So I was able to like click on the news pretty quickly after the uh, the alert came uh over my phone, the first news alert. But it it was wild. I mean, it was the kind of thing that you just can't believe that you're even looking at. Yeah, I mean, and just trying to gather the facts and as always, the reactions on social media, uh, many of them could be disheartening, right? So you had a lot of people on the right uh, automatically kind of saying this was a setup, you know, uh, the Secret Service had it in for them and all this other stuff. I mean, that was all over social media. It was all over Twitter and, and all that stuff. Uh, before really any of the facts even came out, right? And and we talk a lot about, yeah. Chris, about people having their narratives. And when something happens, they're not really looking for the facts. They're just looking for how what happened can support their narrative. And any fact that goes against their narrative just gets thrown out. But the same thing happened. I had other people hit me up saying, oh, this was definitely fake. He put all this on. Go ahead. No, I said the, the same thing. I was, I, I was actually... Uh, shocked and people listen to the podcast might uh, be saying, you know, how can I be so uh, naive? But I was, I was surprised the number of people who immediately came with the, you know, either this was a grand conspiracy by the deep state or he totally faked it. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, I mean, that's a heck of a thing to fake. <laughs> that's a, this is what I told people. Cause I had a bunch of people in my, all in my inbox and stuff like that talking about this is fake. I'm like, guys, Basically, what you're saying when you say this is fake is, let's put it in context. While Trump is winning an election, he somehow conspires with the Secret Service and basically the FBI, who are both under the Biden administration, right. to, cre- to create a fake assassination attempt where somebody gets killed. Yeah. How in the world do you conspire with two organizations that work for the person that you're running against doesn't make a lot of sense guy and why would you even take that chance if you're winning if you're up in an election right now just doesn't yeah. make a lot of sense but we have our narratives we have our narratives. and nobody on our side could do something that bad or nothing like this could happen to Trump where it could actually help him and then the other thing that I saw was people kind of saying it was bad but not want to say it was too bad because they know it could politically help Trump, right? Yeah. Obviously, I'm not a Trump fan, never have been. But what I realized, Chris, in watching this is I was just like, dude, we have to be able to condemn condemn things like this without equivocation, without qualification, and without a lecture on how bad the other side is. I've been getting... Uh, uh, emails and memes about yeah this was bad but look at all the others look at what happened to Nancy Pelosi's husband look at guys yeah. stop just sit down and say every, both sides you don't want to believe this both sides have their lists we can decide which one is worse some other time this was completely wrong we need to focus on condemning this and obviously the only person that's fully responsible for this is the young man that did it God rest his soul. 
But we can also look at what we can do to calm things down based on what we share and how we go about our lives. Let's condemn it, see what we can do better, and then move on later. But when you but when you don't clearly condemn it, period, and you had all these stuff, all this stuff that you're adding to it, you know, you actually can make things worse. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah. No, for sure. And you you said the word that has really been my thinking uh, since this happened, which is narrative. And the the fact that so many uh, Christians have allowed a political party or political disposition to really become almost your entire worldview, right? right? So that every single thing that happens, you interpret it through the lens of this political framework through which you see the world. Um, and I, I've had to remind people, I won't say some of the people because it's, I just, it breaks my heart that I had to make this reminder, but we, we have a grand narrative that's rooted in the scripture. Um, it, it is a narrative that says that we serve a God who created the universe, who uh, worked through uh, Israel to reveal himself ultimately through Jesus Christ and who is still in charge of the universe and is going to redeem the whole thing, right? That's our grand narrative. And so we're going to interpret activity in the world through some grand narrative. Let it be that narrative as opposed to a political narrative that says immediately, well, he faked it or this was, you know, something in the deep state. We Like some of my conservative friends, I'm like, let's not underestimate the incompetency that can exist to allow some random crazy guy to do something incredibly wild. And, you know, if, if some kind of conspiracy comes up later, as you were saying, we can deal with that when the facts produce. But you, you can't know, just assume it off story. top. You, that should not be the first thing that pops up. And, and, and here's the other thing. The same people who were talking about how silly the conspiracy theories were on the right when it comes to the election and all that stuff came up with a conspiracy theory just as silly based on nothing but their narrative. Yep. And it's like, guys, maybe this is a way that we unify. We're not all that different. We all reach for conspiracy theories when reality just isn't something that is helpful to us and is not politically expedient. Yeah. That's what it tells we have, you. Go ahead. No, I mean, we, we have this gospel centered grand narrative that would allow us in a moment like this to say, yo, this is crazy, but everything's going to be okay. Right? Like if you interpreted the event through that gospel centered narrative, that would be your response. And it, it seems like to me that, that we are so desperate for a narrative that I'm just like, yo, church, let's use the, the, the narrative that we have from the scripture. If we just need a, a grand narrative through which to interpret all the political activity, right. Yep. That would have been a much better message to be coming out from a lot of the people who I saw saying some wild things. Very wild things. And look, we've been going around the country with our um, civic revival, talking about the possibility, maybe even likelihood of political yeah. violence, hoping that it wouldn't happen. Right. Like hoping that it wouldn't come to this. And then you get someone who tries to shoot, you know, shoot the president. It's it's really tough. Another issue on this, though, Chris, is the incompetence by the Secret Service. I mean, that looked like I mean, that was. Awful. The fact that somebody could be on a roof 150 yards away and be there and people be telling you he's up there and y'all don't respond. Yeah. What in the world is going on here? Yeah. The Secret I mean, Service, I saw stuff. the. Go ahead. The director okay. of the Secret Service did respond and say, you know, the buck stops with me and all that stuff. But. I don't know how w much worse you can get. I mean, that that made me lose a lot of confidence in their abilities and in what they're doing right now. So hopefully they do really pull it together because that's inexcusable. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, it's crazy because more stuff just keeps coming out. It was reported uh, this morning. I saw that uh, Crooks actually went through uh, the metal detector with a rangefinder that's used by hunters uh, and snipers and and. It, it was recorded, uh, you know, they reported that it was something suspicious, but still when it was reported that somebody was on the roof and all that stuff, like nobody ever pulled the president off the stage. Like, I don't expect that you just like 
snipe somebody because you saw them and it might be dangerous. Um, but pull the president, the former president, let me you know, check that, pull the former president off the stage, um, check it out. And if there's nothing, the rally can continue. That's right. But that's, I don't know what to say for that level of, of incompetency. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, in a second, we're going to get to some of the practical political impacts of this and also the idea does this make trump a man of destiny we'll be right back on the church politics podcast your eyes on the times you walk ready to speak up but with so many problems you're exhausted trying to keep up this is the church politics podcast where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview we're not trying to be conservative or progressive we're trying to be christian in the public square and i'm black as heaven i'm made in god's image nobody can change my settings hey man cut off my knees and put it into my search it's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth and we are back on the church politics podcast with justin gibbony and the right reverend christian uh christopher butler i almost forgot your name my brother the right you didn't call me trump Right, yeah, yeah. I did call you Trump at uh, where were we in Denver? In Denver yeah. I apologize. For, I don't know if I apologized immediately, but I do apologize for that. But look, and you know, we we made we making fun of Biden. People making fun of Biden for making those mistakes. I made I, I just made the same mistake in Denver. So it happens, folks. It happens. Probably shouldn't happen that frequently, and that's another matter. But I mean, we do have to discuss. So, so first, I want to kind of touch on the practical impact of what happened. There's probably no bigger boost that a leader can get than to go through like a near death experience, especially when somebody's trying to kill them and survive. That's just, I mean, nobody wants to get shot or go through that. But if you ask, if if you got into people's heart and say, do you want to survive something like that and come out like heroically? A lot of people, a lot of leaders would say yes, because that just draws people towards you. Mm -hmm. Obviously him standing up, putting his fist up, the blood coming down. That's whether you like Trump or not, that's an iconic photo, right? Like it's like, I mean, that just, and he's a showman. There was no way in the world. I almost think he would risk what could happen to be a showman in that moment and understand the moment. I mean, if, if we understand that moment, Trump understands that moment. If he has a major talent, it's to be a showman and to take advantage of those kind kind of situations. And he did, uh, what do you see as the practical impact uh, on the campaign of this um, attempted assassination and his survival? Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, you, you read it well. Um, one of the things that we know about that kind of uh, trauma response is that the things that are practiced and instinctive for you are the things that you kind of immediately go to in those moments. And I think what we saw with Trump is that that showmanship and, you know, sort of just being kind of a, a performer that was, that was instinctive to him. And he, you know, did the things he did in those, in, in those moments, but there is no question that there is an air of, you know, inevitability that comes with surviving an assassination attempt, right? Especially the way that he did. I mean, he turns to look at the chart. If he doesn't do that, we're having a whole different podcast today, right? Um, because yeah. millions of people will have seen, like, something terrible that none of us have probably yeah. seen in our lifetimes. Uh, and it would have been on, on live television. Uh, so that, that sort of near, that close, close brush with death I mean, it gives him a sense of, 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 of destiny, something more uh, taking place. I don't think that it's necessarily uh, correct to read the kind of things that I've seen, you know, that you know, God has chosen him and God's hand is on him and that kind of thing. Um, but it creates this, this kind of movie dynamic, right, where it is much more dramatic uh, around him at this point. And, and to me, that can only, that can only play into his election prospects. He was already up before the terrible Biden debate. He was already up before uh, this assassination attempt. And now you have this 
event that no matter who you are, if you have any sort of honesty in you, you have to admit that this humanizes him uh, in a certain way and at the same time makes him so much bigger. Yeah. You know, and it, I don't know what to I say to folks who are running against him. Yeah, I think the most likely outcome of this isn't that he picks up a whole bunch of different, more votes that he didn't have before outside of his base and outside of what he kind of already had, but that the people who were might not have came out, the, maybe the low propensity voters are like all in, right? Like they, yeah. they may be more likely to come out and vote because of this. I don't know that it makes a hardcore Democrat or somebody who's already made their mind up switch, but it does a lot. And it gives him the opportunity, and we'll see what happens with his RNC speech, to really reset, yeah. to move along. And I even heard this from J.D. Vance, who we'll be talking about later, is he's a different man now. This has changed him. Looking at the discipline that he actually showed that surprised me in the debate, mm -hmm. could he actually use this as a reset to say, I see things differently now, I'm different, and I want to. I actually do want to unite everybody? That may be the narrative that he runs with. There's been word that he actually has changed his speech at the RNC based on what happened. I, I wouldn't imagine that he wouldn't do that. But those are some of the impacts. Now, some have gone so far as to say, that he is a man of destiny. In fact, Ross Douthit, who uh, writes for the New York Times, one of my favorite uh, conservative writers, uh, wrote an article uh, entitled Donald Trump, Man of Destiny. It talks about how some have said that this assassination, as I said before, proves that Trump is actually a man of destiny, that there's something there that he keeps getting away with stuff or, or keeps surviving certain issues. He says that Trump is a figure uh, that we all have to admit that Trump is a figure touched by the gods of fortune in a way that transcends the normal rules of politics. He goes in to talk about the philosopher Hegel. He says uh, in Hegel's work, the great man of history is understood as a figure whose own particular particular aims involve those large issues, which are the will of the world spirit. Hegel's paradigm was Napoleon, the Corsican adventurer whose quest for personal power and military glory spread the ideas of the French Revolution, shattered the old regimes of Europe and ushered in the modern age. Douthit says that we all, again, have to admit that Trump is a man graced uh, this past weekend, especially, but always with incredible uh, preter, pre preternatural good luck. I mean, it, if you look at the cases he's been through, all the stuff he's been through, you can't help but say something seems like it's going on here. Right. Douthit goes on to say. That last quality that he has this kind of preternatural uh, good good luck, that last quality is understood by some of Trump's religious supporters as proof of divine favor hmm. and a reason to support him. Absolutely. But this is a presumptuous interpretation. Some notably sinister historical figures have enjoyed miraculous seeming escapes from assassination. The man of destiny that Hegel talks about might represent a test of his society, a form of chastisement, an exposure of the weakness and decay, in which, in which case your obligation is not to support him without question, but to try to recognize the historical role that he's playing and to watch your response to what's being unsettled or unveiled. Interesting article. What is what? What do you say to the idea that Trump is a man of destiny based on what he's been through and somehow he keeps going? He's not things that should have taken everybody that would have taken everybody else out before him simply do not take him out. Some of his religious supporters, as doubt that points out, are saying he's touched by God. He's our man. What do you what's your response to that uh, sentiment? Yeah, I mean, certainly on the the religious front where people are, are very quick to say that, like, God has chosen him to be president of the United States. One, I would say that even if that's true, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's good, right? Because God right. has uh, raised up leaders um, throughout scripture. Uh, they, there's testimony to the fact that God will raise up a leader um, as judgment to uh, folks, even in the uh, you know, if we look uh, eschatologically at scripture, uh, there is all type of warning uh, that leaders will be raised up to, as judgment on people to provide 
for us, whatever the thing is that we want to hear, even though it's not good for us. So uh, I, I like uh, a phrase that uh, our friend Michael Ware introduced in his, his latest book. He introduced this idea of political therapeutic deism, um, which is this idea of reading uh, the sort of religious and divine narratives over all of our politics. I think it's, it's far too easy uh, to do that. And, and that is a stretch too far. But I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of doubt that thinking because that is coming more from a philosophical standpoint, uh, than a theological one, right. uh, necessarily. And really saying that there's something about this guy that if you, uh, if, if you don't pay attention to it, I think that's, that's where doubt that ends up in his argument is that if you, if you ignore this fact or don't, don't contemplate this idea, then you miss something about Donald Trump that certainly will um, handicap your ability to 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 oppose him or to compete with him uh, on on the world stage because there is something uh, about him and, and that's what I would do even with Hegel's philosophy right because we use the word man of destiny and it might sound more like what the religious supporters of Donald Trump uh, are saying that he somehow got this divine path uh, to the White House. Is not to say he's a man of destiny. Is not to say that he's got God's blessing. If I put it in layman's terms, it's like there's something about this dude, right? Like he's not like every other politician uh, or public figure that we uh, that we have encountered. And I, I don't. I think it's very hard to argue with um, at least the idea that you've got to contemplate that if you're going to think about Donald Trump uh, at this point. It's hard to deny that there's something, you know, there seems like something going on there that he just survives all these, all these issues over and over again. And I, I mean, the point you made about the therapeutic deism is so important because everything, everything in the Bible is not about America. Yeah. Everything in the Bible is not about this election. So you don't need to make it biblical and that this means things. And actually you're not even making it all that biblical. If you act yep. like, that this means he's good and God. First, I don't know any man outside of Jesus that we are supposed to follow. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't remember the Bible telling us to follow anybody to that extent. Absolutely. Seriously. Outside of, of, of God himself. Uh, and so, you know, it, it makes you, it makes you wonder where we go from here, but people certainly need to start thinking about what is he saying about the country right now? What does it say that this is the person that keeps coming back and keeps overcoming things we never thought he would overcome. Now, keep in mind, Ross Douthat is a conservative. Ross Douthat is not a Trump supporter, as far as I know. Uh, he's had a lot of criticisms of Trump. So this is not him trying to say, obviously, that uh, that Trump is the guy that God is telling us to, to go with. But we need to think about what it's telling us. And I think Ross Douthat, he didn't plug his book here, but he has a book on the decadence of this generation. And maybe that's kind of where he's going to like, maybe Trump is a symbol of our decadence and we need to see that decadence in him to actually correct it. I don't know. Um, but that may be, you know, maybe part of the point. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think this, um, this, this, that idea is something that's worth contemplating. You know, uh, I, I forget the, the writer, but one of my favorite quotes about um, uh, democracy uh, there's there's a, a writer who said that democracy is the idea that people uh, should get the the leadership that they demand and they should get it good and hard um, and 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 sometimes we have to see this idea that our political leaders in a democratic system in many ways do reflect something about us right now and that that's not to discount everything else that I have said and will say about politics and all of the way that money and uh, power position, all that kind of stuff plays into it. But there's something uh, of, a, of a mirror in a democratic form of government where we can see something about ourselves. Um, I, I do also want to say that if you look at Trump as a man of destiny, and, and doubt that refers to this a little bit in his article, uh, you, in order to compete with or oppose a man of destiny, you've got to do things differently. Um, and so I wonder if, if uh, Joe Biden can turn that around into an argument for himself, kind of be 
uh, you know, not the obvious choice, but like I'm the drunken kung fu master who can, you know, actually deal with this guy. So trust me. Right. I've done it once. I can do it again. And that in a way is kind of his argument. All right. Well, we're going to talk about his vice president pick next. We'll be right back on the Church Politics Podcast. Your eyes on the times you walk ready to speak up. But with so many problems, you're exhausted trying to keep up. This is the Church Politics Podcast, where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview. We're not trying to be conservative or progressive. We're trying to be Christian in the public square. And I'm black as heaven. I'm made in God's image. Nobody can change my settings. Hey man, cut off my knees and put it into my search. It's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth. All right, Chris. I'm going to be honest with you. If if this was probably eight to 10 years ago, I would feel a lot different about this vice presidential pick. I'm going to be honest with you. About eight to 10 years ago, I thought that J.D. Vance could be the next big thing. What y'all got to recall is J.D. Vance was a critic of Trump. J.D. Vance had written this book, Hillbilly Elegy, which I thought was just a, an inspirational book. His story is, is outstanding. I know there's some haters saying that it's not real and people have, from what I can tell and what I've read and what I've seen, that is his story is big. And anytime you have a big story that connects with people, there are going to be people that try to knock it down. To me, that story, you can say what you want, that story is inspirational. It's, it's a kind of American dream story from where he came from. I thought, I, you know, he wrote, you know, uh, an endorsement of Michael Ware's book, you know, one of Michael Ware's first books, like he, which was about Obama, right? He was far, he, I admired that he was thoughtful when it came to economics. He was kind of heterodox when it came to economics, but also you saw a social conservatism about him that was reasonable, right? So for me, I was like, this guy might be something, you know, I, I'm looking forward to see what he'll do. Then came MAGA. And in my opinion, J.D. Vance became one of the ugliest examples of a sycophant for MAGA and for Trump. He did a 180 on a lot of the things that he was saying. He had said that you voting for Trump makes you an idiot, which I, you know, I don't I wouldn't have said that anyway, but he said it. And then he became like his biggest supporter in the Senate. That's why I can't you know, I can't really get a super excited about this because he's shown himself in a way to be. A opportunist. Either he didn't really mean that at the beginning when he wrote it, all that stuff during his book and during his tour and what he was saying, or he doesn't mean it now. Either way, there's some opportunism mixed in with what's going on that to me has just been hugely disappointing. I mean, I think most of the people that are just finding out about J.D. Vance have no idea who he was before MAGA and what he was saying before MAGA. Now, they're kind of painting him as this white supremacist. There's you know, all this other stuff that's just MAGA. But people have no idea what he was talking about before, uh, which is re- really interesting to me to hear how people talk about him not knowing where they were at before. So it's uh, it's interesting, man. Well, what, do you, what are your thoughts on uh, J.D. Vance just initially on him as a person and the changes that he's made over time? Yeah, I mean, I think that the... I, I observed that same trajectory, same, I, I had a very similar response to his book, very inspirational and very insightful, right? Like I, I, I felt like reading the book that if you, if you take his own narrative um, and then look at some of the commentary, even around, around uh, sort of areas of the world that he didn't necessarily come through, I was just, it seemed very insightful, it seemed very inspirational. Um, and like you said, as he got more into politics, you did see just like a, a much more opportunistic um, MAGA style conservatism uh, come online. Uh, and it, it's reflected to me in, in a lot of, uh, of the platform rhetoric, like just much less passionate, I would say, about um, – you know, sort of uh, certain social issues. And that's why for me, like, it's really hard to to sort of rock with populism, um, even though a lot of sort of policy positions that some of the populists take, I agree with. I think that when you, 
when you only judge things not by some kind of a a set of uh, moral frameworks, um, but just through this idea of populism, what do you, you know, quote unquote, the people want, and that I, I think it, it breeds that kind of opportunism, and yeah. and that's really unfortunate because those that moral orient I think can lead you to some of the same conclusions around economics that you know, populists might identify, but it's not because it's populist, it's because it's right. But that's, always that's, be yeah. what's right. And that's a problem with populism in general. Like populism, in my opinion, is more about going against something. So you and I both agree that right now the establishment needs to be checked, that they've gotten out of control and they're, they're not really for the people. But we would do that and check them based on principles and based on solutions, not just based on kind of the demagoguery and attacking the man, attacking the people. Right. We'll say, no, you're doing this wrong and this is what needs to be fixed. He has some of that in his history, but because he's embraced this sort of, you know, right wing populism, it becomes more about look at the progressive, look at the liberals and what I need to do to them rather than just the solutions and things of that nature. Now, something else that I'll bring up, though, is this was an interesting pick, right? I was hoping, and I don't know about you, I was really hoping that he wouldn't pick uh, Haley. Like, Haley, anybody but Haley was kind of my position. I don't like Nikki Haley. I know she gets a lot of props because she's so-called moderate and she's establishment. But when she was writing her name and writing those messages on bombs, telling, you know, finish them on a bomb that's going to probably kill children, um, I've never known any of her policies that were really meant to help the working class. She's somebody to me who is still stuck on heavily stuck on Reaganomics, trickle down economics that I think is a bygone era. I just think the neo liberal, neo conservative stuff, it's over for it. So I really didn't want that to be. But to me, Trump sent a message because word is a lot of corporations were coming to him and saying, do not pick J.D. Vance because J.D. Vance has been coming at corporations. J.D. Vance has been has J.D. Vance is the only Republican I know that said, hey, Lena Khan, who, you know, is my favorite person in the Biden administration by far, Mm -hmm. is doing a good job. Right. He's made his point to say, no, I'm bringing something new to the Republican Party to say we are for working people. Right. For Trump to make that choice to me says that this was a legacy pick. More than anything else that he may actually be thinking about what type of party he wants to leave behind and what type of legacy he wants to leave behind by picking somebody that's not even 40 years old yet either. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was a, a legacy pick. I also think for that, that it was kind of a, a boss pick, right? Because what you say also in the selection of, of J.D. Vance is that this party does not belong to the the other billionaires, really. It belongs to me. Right, right. That's right. right? Like this this is Donald Trump party, and I will do whatever I want to do. And and so there's, there's an element of just saying, just so everybody knows, you don't get to tell me what to do. Uh, right. I get to make the decision for myself. Right. Um, in, in, in so doing, there's also this, this legacy component and maybe something, you know, potentially positive in terms of, uh, you know, continuing in a potential Trump second term, some of the good work that has been done around uh, antitrust, uh, you know, anti-monopoly, uh, work, um, even some of the knots that, that Vance, not as many as I would like to have seen, but some of the knots that he's given to organized labor too, uh, is, is, is hopeful because in those two areas, I do think the Biden administration has made some, some progress that we, I would hate to see us lose. Yeah. And let's be honest for the first time. And since I can remember the RNC had a labor leader speak at the, at the convention. Do in you remember that? Yeah, I don't remember that happening. Like, that's that's a Never. big deal. Like, that's a huge change. And the gen- Democrats better figure this out because guess what? If they can corner them into being the corporate party, into making Democrats the party of the elites, which Democrats are kind of pushing themselves anyway, they're in big trouble. And one of the problems that the Democrats have is all their values when it comes to moral stuff are elite values, right? There's stuff that a lot of people outside of academia and the tops of professions really can't, connect with. And so it seems like a strategic move to say, now we're going to push you off and make you really lose all these working class votes. And if they do, I think they're in trouble. But here's something Z- uh, Zed Jelani 
uh, shared that I felt was interesting. It says that J.D. Vance is one of the only Republicans who supported Democrat efforts to regulate oil uh, rail companies, to rein in pr- the price of insulin, to stop large corporate mergers, and to promote onshoring. That's different, right? So in the midst of all of this, what is clearly to me opportunism, I don't think you can say J.D. Vance hasn't been opportunistic. There may be some opportunities for him to do good. The jury's still out. We still got to see who's going to win the election. But this could get interesting just as far as the GOP, the future of the GOP, and what we see happen with some of the stuff that you're talking about, which is antitrust, which we talked about. Neither the Bushes, Clinton, nor Obama did anything about antitrust. And I think it really hurt the working class. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I think, you know, politically, just in the immediate term of winning the election, if you look at J.D. Vance, uh, the stuff that I said at the, at the beginning of the segment, notwithstanding, I, I still think that J.D. Vance is a is a really sharp political talent. He is uh, a, a great communicator, uh, really smart. He has that narrative behind him. And, you know, Trump campaign has already said, like they're not even hiding the ball on this, that they're going to park him in uh, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, if, if, if we assume, and you can tell me better, but if we, if we assume that, that Georgia is already gone for the Democrats, um, if, if Republicans get Pennsylvania, they can leave Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, Arizona, all that on the board and still win the election. Um, so politically, it's, you know, it's a, a pretty smart move in, in, in my yeah. opinion. Yep, yep. Well, guys, there will be a lot more conversation about this. We got we to take off, man, but keep your eyes peeled. Again, I'm going to ask everybody, don't just pay attention to the narratives. If you're watching conservative cable news or conservative outlets, you're watching progressive outlets, they're going to give you a narrative. Watch it for yourself and figure it out for yourself, okay? Because there's a lot of movement that I don't think some of these kind of like establishment organization or establishment outlets are will are going to either be willing to see are going to uh be able to see and so you need to kind of work it out for yourself because things are changing well you know what it is as always and camp there is a cross that neither political conservatism nor progressivism is fit to bear there's a civic hearing in need of faithful witnesses who love social justice and won't surrender the truth to be loved by the world Make sure that you are engaging with the compassion and conviction of Jesus Christ. Until next time, Ann Camp. Well, I'll let you. Your eyes on the times, you walk ready to speak up. But with so many problems, you're exhausted trying to keep up. This is the Church Politics Podcast, where you can get political commentary from a biblical worldview. We're not trying to be conservative or progressive. We're trying to be Christian in the public square. And I'm black as heaven, I'm made in God's image, nobody can change my settings. Amen. Hey man, cut off my knees and put an end to my search. It's easy to sell your soul when you don't know what it's worth.